Today, I want to talk to you about something where I just be a little bold here. And I'm actually going to break the rules a little. So I'm going to talk about uh, origami that is periodically creased. Um, but as we're going to see, it's not quite periodic in the same sense that I, I think everyone else has been fairly disciplined, with maybe one or two exceptions. It's not quite periodic in the sense of the systems that we've been talking about so far. And I, I apologize if anything is unclear. I, I'm a little shaky on some of the mathematical lingo. So if I start talking about a basis or a Brion zone or something that doesn't make sense in the way that you're used to, uh, please feel free to break in and ask for clarification or ask more substantive questions as well. So uh, my collaborators, this is uh, work done primarily by my student James McInerney, also with uh, Brian Chen, formerly of Penn, who is there and is in the, the math department at St. Andrews. The rest of us are in physics departments, including Chris Santangelo, who is now at Syracuse. And the work itself is called Hidden Symmetries Generate uh, Rigid Folding Mechanisms in Periodic Origami. So origami, I'm sure we're all familiar with it, uh, at least on a popular level. And uh, we see it in all sorts of different contexts. Uh, so people have been able to see cursors. I'll assume you can see my cursor. Uh, Tomohiro Tachi, the great origamist, can make uh, a crease pattern like this and fold it up and form this very intricate bunny. Scientists are making smaller and smaller origami. It's getting into the realm of nanotechnology. This crane, I think, was the smallest origami structure ever at the time that it was folded. It's a uh, micron scale. And people are also looking at folding and cutting up uh, things like graphene, which is a single atom thick, so about as small as you can get. But what really makes origami useful in a sort of technological setting is these repeating patterns. So not something necessarily uh, like this intricate bunny pattern, but a repeating pattern of parallelograms here. And this was designed by Corio Mira. And the motivation here was to have solar panels that could go up into space. So in your rocket launch, of course, you want them to fold them up and compress them. And then when you get to outer space, you want it to have a high surface area and expand uh, so that it can collect the solar energy, including for unmanned missions where you really need it to work well. And if you look at this animation, it seems to work very well in that this person is just pulling on it at two different corners and it's expanding and contracting effortlessly. So that's quite useful. It's basically the same thing you want from your umbrella. You want your umbrella to collapse when it's not in use and then to expand well and have a high surface area when it is in use. And origami has been used in a number of different contexts for exactly that reason, for being lightweight, strong, and compressible. Another context is heart stents, which you want to be very small when they're being inserted into the body and then to expand when they're actually required to uh, support the forces, uh, which is their purpose. It's also used uh, for bulletproof shields. You, you have origami bulletproof shields that can be transported into a combat situation very easily and then can expand to protect personnel. Those are made out of Kevlar. So most origami sheets like this that are used in technology uh, are made of quadrilaterals. And if you do a mechanical counting argument, uh, which I will do, similar to the one that uh, Zhao Ming did and that has shown up in other contexts around here, quadrilaterals should actually be above the critical point. It should be rigid. And of course, it's not. You can see it folds quite well. And the reason it does that is that it's very non-generic. Each one of those panels is an identical parallelogram. And if they weren't, it would not fold. So origami is mostly based around symmetries. The question I want to ask is, can we exploit mechanical criticality rather than symmetry to fold periodic structures that don't have any symmetries? And of course, when you ask this kind of question in the talk, the answer is yes. But as we'll see, the answer is not at all obvious. It's not obvious a priori how we would actually be able to use mechanical criticality to fold trying to get it to work out. So what do I mean by rigidity? So not all origami is rigid origami. Real world origami can have faces that bend and even stretch. But mathematically, I'm gonna describe my origami structure based on topology, how the vertices, edges, and faces fit together. This vertex here is connected to these edges. These edges go around this face. And then the other thing that can't change if we're rigid is the shape geometry of the faces. If this triangle were to stretch 
or to bend, we would not call that a rigid motion. But what we can do is we can take two faces that are joined by an edge and we can bend along them. So let me do this. Uh, I, I can't see myself, but you guys can see me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I can't see myself, so I'll be doing this blind at all. Hopefully, I'm on camera well. So if we just have a crease, we can fold it. We still count that as rigid. And one way to think about origami rigidity is to actually think about it as a rigidity problem that lives not in flat space, but on the two sphere. And the reason we can do that is that we can draw unit vectors that point along each edge of an origami vertex. And we can say, I can try to point those vectors anywhere I want, but when I do that, I can't stretch this angle. This is called the sector angle or the planar angle. It's set by the geometry of the face. So this angle can't change, which means this geodesic distance, which we'll call alpha, can't change on the sphere either. So when I pick my positions of my points on the two sphere, and remember each point now corresponds to an orientation of an origami edge, uh, I have to have the rule that the geodesic distances between them stay fixed by the planar angles. But what can change these gammas in orange are the dihedral angles. So I can fold, and when I fold, these angles change. And just from looking at this, we have a counting argument that says that our four vertex should have a one dimensional configuration space. The reason being that I can move all of these things in two dimensions, S2 has two dimensions, so that's eight degrees of freedom. And then they have four constraints, the four constraints being the four edge lengths, so that'd be a four dimensional configuration space but I can also rotate the whole thing in three ways. So elements of SO3, three-dimensional space. So three of those four dimensions are rigid body motions. The fourth one represents a shearing motion where we pull on this sort of spherical quadrilateral and we're able to pull two points that are opposite to each other apart without stretching any edges. Rather than do that though, I'm gonna go back to real space and I have a very simple way of checking about whether an embedding is rigid. All I have to do if you give me the vertices is check and see do the positions of these vertices stretch out any face. But as it turns out, that's not the most convenient way to describe folding origami. What we would want to do instead is we would want to describe these dihedral angles or fold angles along each of these edges. And what I can think of doing is I can think of a little imaginary frame that I'm going to transport around here. And I'm gonna say, each time I go over one of these angles, I'm gonna rotate it so that it's going from being, uh, having a normal vector normal to this frame to its normal vector being normal to this space here. And then once I do that, I'm gonna rotate it again as I go across the face. I'm gonna rotate it about the normal vector of the face, change my orientation here. And I'm gonna repeat that process. And those successive rotations along faces and along these edges are gonna give me the relationship between the orientation of say this space and this space. And then we have a compatibility condition uh, that we need for a rigid embedding, which is that I can't just pick whatever dihedral angles I want. If I pick some random set of dihedral angles, what I'm gonna find is that if I go on a closed loop, so rotate, 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 and I come back to my same face, in general, if I just picked arbitrary angles, I would not have the same orientation. I would have the face pointing at some different orientation. And therefore, I wouldn't actually have a spatial embedding. And in my mind, with my physics background, I think of this as being similar to electrostatics. Where in electrostatics, if I have an electric field, if I integrate my electric field in closed loop, I have to get that it's zero. And that's the only way that I can have a well-defined electrical um, potential and have my electrical field be the gradient of that. Similar concept here, except we're talking about three-dimensional rotations and we're talking about discreteness. So what I should do is I should rotate, rotate, rotate about each edge, and I should check and see whether I get the identity. And the problem is that that's actually kind of a pain because I don't have any a priori knowledge of where these edges are oriented, but I have to rotate around them. So I'd have to go through and calculate the orientations and how they changed as I applied previous rotations. Unfortunately, almost 20 years ago now, Bocastro and Hall showed that due to how SO3 algebra, three-dimensional rotation algebra works, we can actually undo all of those repeated rotations. And to check to see whether we get the identity, all we have to do is rotate when we're rotating by the dihedral angle rho, always about the x-axis, and we rotate by the 
vector angle alpha always about the z-axis. So it's not truly how you get that, but that's the result. And then the question is, what kind of embeddings does that lead to? Because if we have that satisfied at every vertex, then we are going to have well-defined orientations. And I, if you give me a valid set of dihedral angles, I can tell you the embedding of the origami up to overall translations and rotations. Because if I translate it or if I rotate the whole thing, that's not going to change any of those dihedral angles. So that's the one thing we miss. But what do our embeddings look like? Well, before I get into that, I need to talk about the notion of periodicity and what I mean by periodicity. Because again, I'm going to break the rules of periodicity a little. My structures are not going to be periodic in the normal sense that we've seen so far. So I say a structure is periodic if the topological connections repeat periodically, as is true here, and if the face shape repeats periodically, which again is perfectly true here. And then we say that the configuration is periodic if the dihedral angles on corresponding edges repeat periodically. So if I have this edge here corresponds to this edge here in a different unit cell, and I'm going to say if all those dihedral angles, this edge, this edge, this edge here, this edge here, this edge here, if those are all the same, that's my periodic configuration. And the question then is, do these periodic angles imply a periodic spatial embedding? Does it imply that if I take this unit cell and I translate it, I get this unit cell, translate, I get this unit cell, and so on. And what we saw, where did we go? Here, in this case, in this origami, that was actually true. But as we're going to see, it's not true in general. And before I get into that, I need to talk about how triangulated surfaces are essentially framed. So if I have my triangulated surface and I want to know whether it's a rigid embedding, then what I would do is I would look at the positions of all my vertices and I would check and see whether uh, the positions of my vertices stretched my triangle. But because a triangle is a simplex, that means that uh, if it stretches the triangle, it would also stretch one of the edges. And that's not true of every quadrilateral. If I had a, of every polygon, if I had a quadrilateral, for example, I could change the shape of my quadrilateral without stretching any of the edges. I could shear it or I could bend it. The triangle I can't, which means that the rigid embeddings of the triangulated surface are exactly the rigid embeddings of the corresponding frame. So then again, if I want to say that I have a set of dihedral angles that corresponds to a valid spatial embedding, then that also means that there's a set of vertices that do not stretch any edges of the frame. That gives us access to the technology that's been introduced a number of times now, particularly in uh, Zhao Ming's talk, which is to say that when we do have a frame and we have a valid spatial embedding to start with, we can consider small linear deformations. And when we do that, we have some linear map between the site displacements and the bond extensions, which is given by the rigidity matrix, which is determined by the geometry of the embedding and also by the bond topology of the embedding. We also have a relationship between the bond tensions and the forces on the site. And it turns out that the rigidity matrix and this linear operator, which we call the equilibrium matrix, are simply transposes of one another. And I apologize in advance. I think I sometimes use R for the rigidity matrix and I sometimes use C for the rigidity matrix in the slides. And then also we have the dynamical matrix, which was important for Vincenzo's talk where he was looking at finite frequencies. The dynamical matrix we get just by composing these two to get a map between the site displacements and the site forces. And this led to the index theorem that we've seen in John Ming's talk and Varda's talk, uh, where we find that the difference between the number of degrees of freedom and the number of constraints is equal to the difference between the number of zero modes and the number of states of self-stress. That follows from linear algebra. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell was the first person to think something like this, but he didn't have the notion of states of self-stress. You can look at Caledine over a century later uh, for the type that does have states of self-stress, which means that I can refrain like this that's rigid, and then I can move a bond here, and it has a floppy mode, a zero mode, and it's also stress, stressed. So floppy mode, I guess maybe I should call this a, a flex, a first-order deformation. So adding a constraint must either remove a zero mode or add a state of self-stress. And what we find here is that periodic triangulations are automatically mechanically critical. Unlike generic frames, which can be either above the critical point, below the critical point, or at it, necessarily a periodic triangulation is mechanically critical. 
And we can see that by Euler's formula for polyhedron, which relates the number of vertices, faces, and edges to the Euler characteristic. If we have periodicity, if we repeat our units all over and over, we've essentially put on a two torus, and the two torus has Euler characteristic zero. And if we're triangulated, well, if we're triangulated, each face has three edges, but each of those edges is shared between two faces. So to avoid double counting, we would say the number of edges is three halves times the number of faces. So I can use that to eliminate faces from this constraint here and get a relationship between vertices and edges, specifically that three times the number of vertices is equal to the number of edges. And if we do the mechanics, if I think about a frame, there are three degrees of freedom in each vertex because I can displace in three dimensional space. And I have one constraint for each edge so that the edge length can't stretch. If I think about my bell castro hall condition, then I'm actually changing the angles of the edges. So my degrees of freedom actually live on the edges. And when I go around a vertex, I have to have that that rotation comes back to zero. And since the rotations live in three dimensional space, we could talk about three Euler angles, for example, and I actually have three constraints on each vertex. So I have this weird sort of duality where my constraints are turning into degrees of freedom and vice versa. But either way I choose, and they're equivalent, they give me the same rigid embeddings, again, up to rigid body translations and rotations, I have 3v is equal to e, and that tells me that the number of degrees of freedom is equal to the number of constraints. So either way, we have uh, the mechanical critical point. That's the definition of the mechanical critical point or the Maxwell point. And that leads us to ask, are we going to have edge modes? And also, are we going to have a unique periodic ground state? And what we have seen before is that when things are mechanically critical, they don't seem to have unique periodic ground states. They have families of uh, periodic ground states. And this is the Getz -Hut Guess Hutchinson argument. So I, I think Vincenzo, just from looking at my abstract, inferred that I'd be talking about this, and indeed I will. And the Guess Hutchinson argument, as I understand it, goes like this, which is that when we have mechanical criticality, the degrees of freedom within the cell balance with the constraints. And what I mean by that is, Within my repeating unit cell, I have what a physicist would call a basis, where I have some set of positions of all of my vertices. And I have some degrees of freedom associated with each uh, of those. And then I have my constraints. But I can change things. I can change my lattice vectors, my lattice primitive vectors, where I say that the system should repeat itself if I translate it over by a lattice vector. And if I look at this, in each still image in this animation, I have two lattice vectors. I can go to the right and I can kind of go diagonally into the right upward. But those vectors are actually changing. They're getting larger and here they're getting smaller. So I can think of changing my lattice vectors and also my basis vectors that tell me, for example, the orientation of the red triangle relative to the orange triangle. But again, the basis vectors cancel out with the uh, constraints. So if I say that I have a D periodic structure in D dimensions, then I have D times D degrees of freedom associated with changing the periodicity vectors. But these are different Ds for a reason. So the number of dimensions of space is not necessarily the number of directions in which I'm periodic. So these are different Ds. And furthermore, if I include my lattice vectors and I allow them to rotate, then I have D times D plus one divided by two rigid body motions. So I have modes of translation, I have D of those, and then I also have rotations, I have D times D minus one divided by two of those. And if I count this up, what I'm looking at is saying, if I look at two dimensions here, I should have four degrees of freedom associated with choosing my two, two vectors for my lattice vectors. And I only have three rigid body motions. I have translation in the X direction, translation in the Y direction, and then rotation in the plane. So if I have a four dimensional space of rigid embeddings, and I only have uh, three of them that are related by rigid body modes, then I should have some mode that involves changing bond angles. So this is what we would call a guest mode or a guest Hutchinson mode. And you can see it on display in this animation. This, this mode is the mode that uh, Vincenzo showed this last time, a mode of dilation, where these vectors are getting longer and shorter by the same amount, and the angle between them is not changing. If we repeat that argument in three dimensions, we should actually find that we have uh, three floppy modes like this because we have uh, three three vectors that we get to choose, that's nine, but we only have three translations and three rotations, that's six, so we're left with three. 
And when we tried to apply this argument to origami, we got a little stuck because we're embedded in three dimensions, but we only have two periodic directions. So we only get two three vectors that we get to choose, that's six degrees of freedom, but we still have our three translations and three rotations, so that's six constraints. So by this argument, the dimension of the configuration space should be zero. Somehow origami was less flexible than normal frames. So that's kind of weird and kind of a sad negative result. And as we're going to see, there's a way around it. And the way around it is I take my origami unit cell, and this blue arrow is meant as a reminder that the orientation is preserved as I go on a closed loop around an individual vertex. And I'm going to associate the left edge here with the right edge here, the bottom edge here, with the top edge here. And I'm going to think about the rotations that my system would undergo as I rotate about this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, and come back to where I started. And there's no reason in our logic that I would have to come back to the same orientation. The fact that I come back to the same orientation on contractible loops doesn't mean that they're well in this non-contractible loop. And similarly, I have an additional non-contractible loop on the torus here going upward. So do I need to preserve orientation there? Well, the answer is no. What I do need to say is that on a closed loop, I need to preserve orientation. So if I say, I'm going to do some rotation R1 as I move one last vector to the right, R2 as I move one lattice vector upward, and then R1 inverse as I move leftward, R2 inverse as I move downward, I have to come back to the same orientation. So I multiply all these together. I find that that has to add up to the identity. These two, two rotations have to commute. And I skipped some steps there. If I was careful, I'd be considering the fact that R1 could end up rotating the axis that R2 rotates about. But if I actually do it the right way, I get the same relationship. So R1 and R2 have to commute. And with very few exceptions that, that we're not really going to talk about or care about involving rotations of pi, the fact that they have to commute means that they will be coaxial. The rotations will be about the same axis, which means that they'll be the same in every unit cell as well. So if I go through and I start gluing my unit cell together here, then there's no reason, even though these two faces correspond to one another, that as I look at the successive rotations, there's no reason that they have to have the same orientation. So what do we get then? Well, what we get is that the unit cell is not just translating as it would be if it was strictly periodic as I move from one unit cell to another, it's actually rotating around. But because they have to be coaxial, I can't rotate whatever way I want. I can't get something that looks like it's covering a sphere. Instead, what I'll get is something that is singly curved and looks like it's a section of a cylinder. Not every vertex lies on the same cylindrical surface, but if I look at corresponding vertices in neighboring cells, they all lie on a single cylindrical surface. And so what we have then is we have something that seems like a crystal where if I only look at my dihedral angles, they very much are periodic. But if I look at my actual embedding, it is not periodic. So a periodic crystal would be one in which I have two or more or fewer uh, translations, discrete translations. And if I translate the whole thing, the structure will look the same. Here though, I have to translate and rotate. I have to translate and then I have to do my rotation before the structure looks the same. And a translation and a rotation composed with one another is called a screw motion. They have their own algebra. So because these aren't quite crystals and they're associated with screw motions, I like to call them screwy crystals. We still have the question though of whether we can fold them. Uh, someone coming in on the mic there, was that a question? I feel like I'm in my class. Is that can, yes. I, can I ask a question? This, yes, please. Uh, this is Vincenzo here. Yes. Do, does this have anything to do with symorphic symmetries? Um, Non-symorphic symmetries that, that involve things up to a translation. Uh, so, so, sorry, I'm, I'm getting those a bit mixed up. Is that like a translation composed with a reflection or something? What's a symorphic? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I think. I think the answer is yes, in the sense that they're, nope. they're both these symmetries that are related to a discrete translation and then something else like a reflection. Other than that, I don't know what the relationship is. Certainly, I don't think that the arguments I'm gonna make here, which very much are concerned with the details of these rotations that can be 
continuous object where I could think of slightly changing how much it rotates would be rather different because I think the ones you're talking about would be a, a discrete symmetry that I couldn't think of it as being slightly different. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so definitely in the same family as something like that. But the question now is, now that we think about the fact that we do have rotations and, and per Vincenzo's question, in my response, we can think about the rotations changing slightly. We can go back and look at this again and say, now is it possible that the dimension of our configuration space is non-zero? Now is it possible that we have a whole family of embeddings like we saw for these little animations here, like we have here? Are we guaranteed to have some folding mode purely from the fact that we're at the mechanical critical point? So what I wanna think about now is I'm gonna start from some valid embedding. So I have some set of rows that corresponds to an embedding and I'm gonna change them a little. Epsilon is my solid parameter and I'm gonna change my row by phi. So I'm gonna say, as I go from this space to this space, I'm gonna rotate it a little bit. And then as I go from this space to this next space, I'm gonna rotate it a little bit as well. And while I'm doing that, I'm building up displacements. These are my displacement vectors U and they keep getting bigger as I go across through these rotations or they could get smaller if they canceled out instead of adding up. And if I think about what's happening here, if I'm doing an infinitesimal rotation to my face, then if I draw a vector on my face, any vector, then that vector is going to get this little thing that people like to call an angular velocity. That makes me a little nervous because I'm not actually talking about dynamics here. But the vector is gonna acquire an additional displacement that is perpendicular to the original vector. So I can express that as some omega, some quote unquote angular velocity crossed with that vector. And then that creates a problem at the edge because the edge actually lies on two different faces. It has two different omegas that's associated with. So if I look at this transformation, this transformation has to be valid for each omega, which means that the difference between those omegas has to point along the edge itself. Because when I take this crossed with the edge, it goes away. And the amplitude of that will be by definition, just the change in the dihedral angle. So I get that the difference between angular velocities points along the edge and is proportional to the dihedral angle. And if we go back and think then about our vertex condition, we can go back and think instead of the Bel Belcastro hole condition, uh, we can think about uh, the linearized version of that. And when we do that, we just add up all of these changes and we go around our vertex and we find that the sum of the dihedral angles times the uh, directions of the edges, so this is the unit vector that points along the edge, has to sum to zero. That is our vertex condition for our changes in our folding angles up to linear order. And that should be familiar to those of you who, who do this sort of mechanic stuff. It looks exactly like what we would have for force balance of a state of self-stress. So our orientation closure on our triangulated surface is sum of phi i r i hat equals zero about each vertex. Force balance for a state of self-stress is the sum of t i r i hat equals zero about that same vertex. And what that means is if you give me a state of self-stress, I can turn that into a set of folding angles and vice versa. So any zero mode other than a global translation or global rotation, I can turn into a state of self-stress for the triangulated surface and any state of self-stress, I can turn back into a folding mode. If I want to get displacements, it's a little more involved because if I want to get displacements, I have to essentially integrate that twice. I have to take my phi's and add them up to get my omegas, my rotations. And then once I have a rotation of each face, I have to add up the rotations of each face and how that gets me additional displacements traveling along each edge. So this vertex duality it's called, the duality between zero modes and states of self-stress is known in the origami literature. And I actually don't know who to credit with it. With it. If any of you knows, please let me know. It seems to have been discovered and rediscovered a few times. And again, this is something that I wanna emphasize is not true of non-origami frames. So the mechanical criticality condition says that if something is critical, then if I create a zero mode, I also create a state of self-stress but they live in the left and right null space of a linear operator. And the left null vectors and the right null vectors do not bear any particular resemblance to one another. So in general, I can't tell you anything about a zero mode based on the shape of the state of self-stress. So this is something that is really quite special 
to origami systems. So now we can actually put all this together. And I can say that if I have a spatially periodic embedding, I have three global modes, translations in the X direction, Y direction, and Z direction. And if I have a cylindrical embedding, turns out I only have two global modes because an X displacement actually doesn't look the same in different cells because I want to think about the local reference frame of the cells. So the only two that look the same would be translation along the axis of rotation and then rotation about the axis of rotation. Both of those are my global modes. But either way, whether I have three or two, then my global symmetries give me global rigid body modes. And then mechanical criticality again says that if I have these rigid body modes, I should have the same number of global states of self-stress, states of self-stress that are the same in every cell. But now I go one step further than that. And I say, well, my global states of self-stress usually are how I determine the elastic response of the system. That's usually why I care about them. But now I can use the origami vertex condition to actually turn them back into global folding modes. It seems kind of weird. So we went from translational modes to states of self-stress to folding modes, but the logic really does work out. And every one of those modes of translation turns into a folding mode, something that's very much not a rigid body mode. So our global symmetries for the origami actually guarantee that we're gonna have global folding modes, modes that don't actually respect the symmetries just from this counting argument in the middle. Um, so uh, this, this is an important point here. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to come in there. Otherwise, I'll be pressing on and I wanna think about a problem that we had, which is actually when we got to these and we got this three dimensional space, uh, we were a little surprised because we weren't expecting to see three modes. And in fact, we realized that we had to look to higher order and see whether these linear modes really extended to uh, nonlinear order. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say, go to the next step. My dihedral angles are going to change by my little phi's, little because I have epsilon front, and even smaller epsilon squared size. And when I do that, I still get my linear constraint, which is that my phi's have to lie in the null space of the equilibrium matrix. They have to be the same as the states of self-stress. But I can expand this Belkostra hole condition to second order. And when we do that, what we find is that our second order conditions, we involve the second order size, because they're second order in epsilon squared. And then another way to be second order in epsilon is to be phi squared. And what we have is that around each vertex, this contribution from psi is joined by this contribution from phi squared, where now we have something that is pointing along the normal direction of a face, or more generally about ri hat crossed with rj hat, where i is just something that came, comes before j as we go around in a circle here. And you could say, well, wait, how do I know where to start my circle? How do I know where one is? Unfortunately, it turns out that where you start doesn't matter as long as the phi's themselves obey the first order conditions. And you could look at this and you could say, well, doesn't this mean all of my phi's should extend to second order? I mean, I can always find some psi that will cancel out without, with any contribution that I could have here. And actually that's not true. And it's not true because even though the equilibrium operator that's essentially being acted act on the size here is square, it's not invertible. So it is true that we can find some size that will work uh, as long as this contribution doesn't lie in the null space of the equilibrium operator. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit things on the left here with uh, vectors that lie in the left null space of the equilibrium operator. And that's going to kill this term entirely. And we're going to get some constraint purely on the phi's. And I'm going to talk now about the generic case. And by the generic case, I mean something that is spatially periodic, but is not actually flat. So I'm going to think of something like the mirror ori that's already been bent a little. So I don't have to worry about any additional zero modes. My only zero modes are going to be those translations in the x direction, y direction, and z direction. There's zero modes, so they live in the right null space of the rigidity matrix, which also means that they lie in the left null space of the equilibrium matrix, since those matrices are just transposes one another. And so I can hit the whole thing with these three modes. And what I get is this constraint now, 
where now I take this contribution and I'm summing it over all the vertices in the unit cell. And I have this constraint that's second order in the phi's. And notice that it's a vector value constraint. I need all three components of this to vanish. And now we get something that looks very much like Stokes' theorem. I don't know if there is a rigorous statement about Stokes' theorem for uh, systems like this that are uh, discrete and have this form. But we can show that actually most of these contributions about a unit cell, no matter how big the unit cell gets, cancel out. So in the end, all we have to do is we sum this around a loop on the outside of the unit cell. So even if this was a 10 by 10, I wouldn't have 100 terms. I just have more like 20 or 40 terms. And I'd go around here, and I'd add this all up. And again, I would have this constraint that would be quadratic on my phi's here. And that would seem to be vector valued. And our result here then is that, the, that actually this constraint is exactly the one that you would work out if you calculated how this first order term led to a second order correction in the orientation as you go around. So that same path that I drew earlier, if I go around between cells, uh, it's guaranteed that I'll come back to my orientation in linear order. But it turns out that actually, in order to have second order corrections, my linear modes actually have to preserve it up to second order. So the line linear folding modes extend to second order, meaning I can find some psi here, if and only if they ensure orientation closure as I move between cells. So that, that's a rather surprising result. There's no reason a priori to work out that way. We we're only able to show it through this uh, direct calculation here. And we actually have a problem. And the problem is that we have these three linear folding modes. And this is a vector value constraint, which means that it would seem like we would have three constraints on those three modes, which would suggest that we have a zero dimensional space. And that, that would be kind of sad, and we had reason to think that that wasn't true. So we went through and checked this carefully. And what we found was that essentially, these are what I called R1 and R2 before. So these are the rotations that are induced by traveling along the first and second lattice direction. Our requirement, again, is that those should commute to second order. And if they commute to second order, it turns out that that is equivalent to saying that omega-1 cross and omega-2 cross commute. Now, what are omega-1 and omega-2? Omega-1 and omega-2 are the angular velocity vectors that are induced in the first and second lattice directions. And when I write this cross product here, what I mean is that this is the matrix, that when I act on the matrix, this matrix on a vector, that's the same as taking the cross product between omega-1 and that vector. So these are skew-symmetric uh, vectors that exist as uh, combinations of generators of SO3. And in fact, this commutator is equal to the cross product matrix between omega one crossed with omega two. So our requirement then becomes that omega one and omega two, the angular velocities in the two directions, that they have to be collinear so that their cross product vanishes. So now we've gotten down to saying, okay, they have to be collinear. So they point in the same direction. That looks like two constraints here. I need to say that theta and phi or whatever angles I'm using to describe their directions point in the same direction. So it seems like I only have two constraints on my three modes. So it seems like I should have a one-dimensional configuration space, very much like the two-dimensional guest modes. But actually, again, we had some numerical evidence that suggested that wasn't true. So we went back and looked at this again. And what we found is that we also have position closure. We also have that if I look at how the positions change as I move right one cell, up one cell, left one cell, down one cell, that when the positions change, the positions can't change. So if I take my omegas and cross them with my lattice vectors, my lattice parameter vectors L1 and L2, position closure requires that these cross products be equal. And what that means is that both sides of this equation have to be perpendicular to L1 and perpendicular to L2, meaning they have to point in the normal direction, normal to the plane of my unit cell. And that also means that omega1 and omega2 have to lie in the plane that is normal so the normal direction, meaning omega one and omega two have to lie in the plane of the cell, which means they're already confined to a two dimensional space. So the requirement that they be collinear is just that the perpendicular component of one in that two dimensional space is zero perpendicular to the other. So the requirement that the angle between them in a two dimensional space be zero or pi is simply one requirement. So what we have is we have a three dimensional space again and if we want to satisfy the second order conditions, we only have one non-trivial requirement on it. 
the component of this vector that points in the direction normal to the plane, that that vanish. And that, in fact, was what we wanted to see because that was the result that was already observed by Ta Tomohiro Tachi in 2015, though he did not have this explanation for why it should be a two dimensional space. We we're able to provide some explanation in terms of the second order rigidity conditions for that observed fact that triangulated surfaces could fold up into two dimensional state spaces. And the argument is a bit different for the developable case. For the developable case, what I mean by that is that all of these edges lie in the plane. It's starting off perfectly flat. And then it's easy to see that we should only care about the direction perpendicular to the plane because that's the only non-zero component of any of these vectors. But we also have to worry about the fact that we have more linear zero modes. Now, if we have V vectors in our unit cell, we have two plus V uh, linear modes because I can translate each, each vertex in my unit cell, I can translate it uh, in, in the perpendicular direction to the unit cell. And also I can translate the whole thing within the unit cell in the X and Y directions. So I have two plus V degrees of freedom there. And then for constraints, well, I have a constraint associated with each vertex V. And now without any of this fancy business, I have that the dimension of the configuration space should be two. So regardless of whether it's developable or generic, we have that we should have a two dimensional configuration space. And you'll note that that argument was based on the second order conditions. We, we know that the second order conditions don't guarantee that we have an extension. There are things that work to second order that fail at higher orders. But in practice, what people have seen in origami is that the second order conditions are usually good enough. And from there we go to numeric. So I have no idea how to prove this analytically uh, to higher order, but we can certainly check it numerically. So what we do to do that, uh, what my student James does, is we start from a spatially periodic state and we attempt some change in the dihedral angles that we choose to obey the second order conditions. And because we attempt a finite change, of course, these won't be perfect. But we can see how bad they are because we can apply the Belcastro hole condition and we can see that this thing won't actually add up to the identity, which means that its trace won't actually be three. So if we penalize it and we say the amount by which it differs from three squared is our penalty, and we add up over all the vertices, we have a cost function. And then we can use the steepest descent method to minimize that cost function. And we can find something that's a very good approximation actually does satisfy the Belkastro hole condition. And then all we have to do when we're doing that is tell it not to just go back to the origin, tell it not to retreat to the place we started. We don't want to go back there. And we can continue on in that way. We can keep choosing directions that satisfy the first order conditions once we get away from the uh, flat state. And we can sort of move whatever direction we want numerically, continuing to minimize things in our two-dimensional space. So what does that look like? Well, we have this two-dimensional space and it's, an, it's embedded in a 12-dimensional space here because I have 12 dihedral angles, any of which could be between zero and two pi if I don't worry about self-intersections. Uh, but we, it's hard to plot things in 12-dimensional space. So all we plotted was the components of the uh, strain tensor so we could get down to three-dimensional space. And what we see indeed is that we have a two-dimensional surface here that can lead to some pretty substantial strains because we aren't actually materially stretching something like paper. We're only changing the distance between things by folding it. So that adds up to a large strain. And the curvatures can also be pretty large. So this is sort of the change in angle per unit cell here. And we can get up to things of order one, be positive or negative. We can curve upward or downward. This point at the center here is our spatially periodic state. And then as we go upward here, we can actually leave one of the creases unfolded. We can require that we don't fold a crease, which would mean that we could go on this path even if the two triangles there were replaced with one quadrilateral. And that's what these one dimensional lines are with the arrows on them. They're within our two dimensional space. And this path is just to show that if we continued on that one dimensional line long enough, eventually we would come back to the origin. It doesn't hit a wall and stop. It just keeps going again, if intersections are involved. So we can plot this. So sorry, it's the, the change in the shape is here. It's gonna be pretty small, but we're traveling and this black point is showing how we're traveling through our two-dimensional configuration space. And we can see that that's continuously causing our triangulated origami sheet to curl up into cylinders in different ways. And we could also do this for developable origami. 
And it just turns out developable origami is a bit more of a pain numerically. So we haven't filled in the whole two-dimensional space, but we could if we wanted to. So now with the very little time remaining, I want to go back to something that was an original motivation for us and also relates to what uh, Jiaoming was talking about and what Vincenzo was talking about, which is that we can think of generalized block modes. So I can have displacements that a real block mode would multiply by phase factors in neighboring cells. So N1 and N2 are my cell index. And as I go from one cell to another, I would multiply by a phase factor. But if you look at the block argument, if you don't worry about your boundary conditions, that so-called phase factor can actually be any complex number. So our generalized block modes are actually modes that don't just oscillate, but they grow and shrink as we move in these different directions here. And dynamics, so if we're looking at forces and displacements, actually obeys reciprocity. And what that means is that if I look at the total number of zero modes and the number of states of self-stress at some value of z, that's equal to the same quantity evaluated at one over z. So in particular, on the left edge, the modes where E1 is less than one, the total number of zero modes and states of self-stress is equal to the number on the right edge. But if we go back and we do this analysis carefully, what we would find is that the equilibrium matrix evaluated for some value of Z, so we're assuming that modes have this form here, is not the transpose of the rigidity matrix anymore. It is the transpose of the rigidity matrix evaluated at the opposite Z, one over Z. So our new index theorem, the same index theorem that John Ming talked about and I had up and that Varda talked about, says that the difference between the number of degrees of freedom and the number of constraints per cell, I should say, is equal to the number of zero modes at Z minus the number of states of self stress at one over Z. And what that means in particular is that for a critical frame, generically, it can polarize. There's no reason that the number of zero modes at Z has to equal the number of zero modes at one over Z. So that's kane lebensky topological polarization. And Vincenzo was on this paper. He could tell you the story better than I could perhaps, but uh, Brian and uh, Chris and Vincenzo and other people took these triangulated sheets and they wanted to topologically polarize them. And they thought they'd be able to because uh, you're able to do it for generic frames. And these were just essentially frames. And my understanding is that poor Brian looked for polarizations and he couldn't find any, which was annoying because for generic frames, they, they popped right out at you. And he ended up programming a computer to generate new uh, bond topologies and to manually check to see what the topological polarization was. And the computer went through tens of thousands of different trials uh, before they gave up and found that there was just no way to topologically polarize. So our motivation here was actually to explain that. And we did explain that in our own paper published uh, quite recently. And we have to go back to the vertex condition. The vertex condition is really what makes origami different from generic frames. So it's saying that anytime I have a zero mode, I can turn it into a state of self-stress and vice versa. And there's, there's a bit of technical detail here because once I have the fives, how do I get to the displacements? But it turns out the displacements are also modes at the same Z. So that means that the number of zero modes on one edge has to equal the number of states of self-stress on one edge. We put those together. And what we find is the number of zero modes on one edge is equal to the number of states of self-stress on the opposite edge. That's mechanical criticality. But the origami vertex condition says that the number of zero modes on one edge is equal to the number of states of self-stress on the same edge. And what that means is that the number of zero modes on one edge has to equal the number of zero modes on the opposite edge for origami, which means there's no way for origami to topologically polarize. By definition, if this is true, this is the unpolarized state. So we don't have this cool topological class present in origami. But uh, what they were able to do for this paper was they were able to show that if they punched holes in things, then they could polarize it. And we understand that now based on a paper by Walter Whiteley, who was uh, here earlier. I hope he's able to see this. Um, and what he and his collaborators did, as I understand it, is that they showed that if you repeat this sort of analysis with a block hole structure, so holes here, and then a block is just something that's a uh, quadrilateral face or higher, something that's not a triangular face. Well, previously, if I went on a closed loop and I looked at the position, I didn't need to worry about the position anymore. And the logic was I could always decompose things into a single vertex. And when I go around the vertex, and if I have my face image with the same orientation as the original, it also has to have the same position because they share this vertex. Here, that's not true anymore. Here, we don't have that condition. 
So the position compatibility, the notion that the position has to come back to where it was before is not guaranteed by orientation compatibility anymore. We have a new requirement. Similarly, if I think about modes of equilibrium and I think about force balance, for, if I just had individual particles, I would just need to have the force add up to zero. But if I have an extensive object, then for equilibrium, I need the torque to be zero as well. And that's a non-trivial condition. And it turns out these two new non-trivial conditions are the same non-trivial condition. So we would say the triangulated surface is self-dual. The zero modes turned into states of self-stress. For the block hole structure, there's still a duality. But what it is, is that the uh, zero modes only turn into states of self-stress if you turn all the blocks into holes and all the holes into blocks. So the block hole structure is still dual, but it's no longer self-dual, so that it's able to topologically polarize. So rather than having this, we would have that the number of zero modes is equal to the number of zero modes on the ops edge under the black hole swap, so that the structure can polarize. So I'm, I'm running low on time here, so let me just finish up by saying that this doesn't mean that the origami is topologically trivial. It means that it actually belongs to a new topological class, where previously we had for frames, we had just uh, zero dimensional points in the Brillouin zone or the Berlin zone, as some of us apparently call it, uh, that the origami has one dimensional lines, which really modify its mechanical properties. I won't explain that, but I'm happy to chat about it. And that also we can do this with magnets. So uh, I have a paper where we actually looked at magnetic systems and we showed that magnetic systems could be mapped formally onto origami systems. And we could say that these degenerate frustrated anti-ferromagnets, their ground states were actually equivalent to the rigid body states, the folding modes of origami. And then very briefly, I want to tease something we're working on now, which is that you can use this analysis for quadrilateral origami, uh, but we found out that that was not terribly satisfying because uh, to do that, you have to add in additional diagonals and it actually breaks some of the things that make quadrilateral origami so special. So we're working on a new formalism uh, to deal with that. So uh, I'll end there and I'll advertise, this was the main part again, and then we have the uh, magnetic version, and then we have something where this is not origami, but it's the same class as origami, and it shows the topological implications of all of this. And then we have something in preparation for the uh, quadrilateral stuff. So. I'll leave it there. And I'm happy to take your questions or follow up with you uh, offline. Thanks, Seb. That, that was really great. Um, are there any questions? So Walter is in the audience, by the way, just yes. in case you didn't notice. Yeah, so I, I, I saw his comment. Yeah, so, I, so the statement I don't entirely understand. So I, I know there is this notion of lifting and I don't understand them too well. So the Maxwell Cremona diagrams relate to how you can take states of self-stress in 2D and embed them. And at one point, I think we convinced ourselves, this isn't in the paper, that you could do all of this in 3D and with torques as well as forces. And it somehow corresponded to embedding in six dimensional space. But I don't remember how that worked exactly or if it was terribly true. So there's, there's all these things like uh, the infinitesimal liftings and area stress functions that all seem very related to this, but I think we never figured out something definitive we could say about those. Zeb, can I ask a question? Um, um, maybe partially related to, to your comments. So one of the things that was never possible to the best of my knowledge in, in uh, topological mechanics was to create a domain wall um, that could actually move exploiting nonlinear mechanisms. I mean, we know how to do that in 1D, but in 2D, I certainly was never able to do that. Um, of course, we also know structure that was in 1D, mm -hmm. like those chiral things that, uh, <clears throat> in the light of some of the work that you, this recent work you've done, could you imagine an analogous idea in, in origami using perhaps this, uh, this chiral structure where you, you, know, you go around and you step forward? Or yeah. does, it, does it even make sense to ask that question? Because maybe the invariant, as you pointed out, is different. So that's the whole, the whole notion of a... Uh... No, I think it's a great question. And you know, I, I, I want to be able to say yes, and it's certainly not impossible. But my first instinct is to say, no, it's, I would guess that it's not possible. And my reasoning is 
you were able to do this in 1D with, with uh, Brian and with Nitin uh, because there's no transverse directions. So you're able to create a soliton that just propagated across as a zero dimensional thing. And the yeah, problem yeah. is that in 2D, we were able to use the guest mode to switch the polarization. But when we tried to do something similar to have sort of a soliton propagate through as a rigid body mode, I think we always ran into the problem that anytime we did that, it would sort of bulge out in the transverse direction. And bulging out in the transverse direction is fine if you're a zero dimensional object on a one dimensional line. But if you're a two dimensional object, well, maybe I'm talking myself into this. So if you're a two dimensional object in two dimensions, you have to bulge out in the transverse direction. And those bulges add up to large displacements eventually. And, but maybe origami is this special thing because you have two transverse directions because it's a two dimensional object embedded in three dimensions. So maybe it actually is possible because you could bulge up into the transverse direction, not if you have in the XY plane and you have a solid time propagating in the X direction, you have a problem if it bulged in the Y direction, but if it bulged in the Z direction, maybe that would be fine. So maybe there's no reason at all you couldn't have these sort of domain wall solitons in, in origami or something like that that had a extra dimension to bulge into. Of course, one would have to come up with a, with a realization that does that. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, great question.